he gets there. The alternative media, Jerry. That's where you hear the truth. You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. As soon as anyone with eyes to see takes a gander at the album art for Bon Iver's newest work, 22, A Million, which debuted live at the Eau Claire Music Festival on August 13th, two months ago to this day of this year, they will know this is one of the most overtly symbol-rich pieces of art so far this century. Titles, lyrics, companion art all convey robust symbolic messages just begging to be deconstructed. And since breaking down the hidden meanings in art and entertainment is very much a media monarchy thing to do, we thought ourselves just the ones to do it. So after tumbling down the symbolic rabbit hole that is Bon Iver's 22 million, we are pretty confident in framing the symbolism in an occult context and a sizable portion in a distinctly esoteric Masonic one. This is not to say that we're implying Justin Vernon, Bon Iver's frontman and creative force. His bandmates or anyone directly involved with the album are either practicing occultists or card-carrying Freemasons. However, we will go out on a limb and state that there are intentional references, both visual and lyrical, to occult and esoteric Masonic concepts that in this concept, context rather, can't be interpreted otherwise. This is despite claims to the contrary by the man behind 22 A Million's album art. Quote, I enjoy the puzzle of creating a ligature. Visual artist Eric Timothy Carlson said in an amazing recent interview for the Walker Art Center blog called The Gradient. Quote, Justin assigned a specific meaning to the numbers and a logic to their creation, but in the end, they are open containers to be filled with new meaning. He also noted, quote, between the numerology, the metaphysical humanist nature of the questions in 22 a million and the accumulation of physical material and symbolism around the music, it became apparent that the final artwork was to be something of a tome, a book of lore, Jung's Red Book, a lost religion, the Rosetta Stone, Sagan's Golden Record, something to invest some serious time and mind in. Something that presented a lot of unanswered questions in wrong ways. A distant past and future. An inner journey somehow very contemporary, end quote. But we believe the questions can be answered, at least some of them. We see a more coherent theme in this work, one that visually and lyrically echoes motifs found in many occult doctrines, including the one at the core of Freemasonry, which, by the way, is metaphysical humanist in nature. So to illustrate this, we're going to analyze the music video for 22 A Million's latest single, and it's called Eight Circle. Quote, for 22 A Million, there will be a lyric, there will be lyric videos, and there are lyric videos for every single song on the album. For 22 A Million, there will be lyric videos that I created with Aaron Anderson for each song that will be available for free on YouTube. Save the big ad experience and the big data, which is great, as it opened another gate for us to expand the language of the artwork into an entirely different realm, time and motion, and the and the casually fluent because internet. So says Eric Timothy Carlson. Although Eight Circle is not the most interesting track on 22 a million, in terms of symbolism, it's possibly the best initiation into the symbolic elements at play throughout the whole thing. First frame of the video, you have to pause and rewind to the absolute zero 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 point to see it. Is a modification of the album cover itself with the word circle written across it and a three circle glyph which symbolizes the track. A square, black and red, yin yang alludes to the number eight and also the letter B as noted in the article and an I takes the central focus. It's also, the point is also merging into the yin yang. These are obviously the initials, Bone Iver. On the topic of the cover, Carlson said the yin-yang proper was in play loosely from the start, working well in the context of the humanist, spiritual pursuits of the project. I created the collage compositions for the LP packaged by hand at 33 inches by 33 inches as it proved the best way for me to deal with the amount of material produced and to massage it all into a sound and organic composition. The center was originally occupied by an altered mandala as a satisfying placeholder waiting to be filled with a final symbol. The yin-yang design we ended up with happened while working in a vector of something on a whim. Changing the symbol into a square proved to be enough to keep it recognizable, but to make it unique to the project. We have no reason to doubt Carlson regarding his decision to make the decision dimensions for the original collage 33 by 33. However, it is curious in relation to another song on the album, which will be today's closing song of the day, 33 God. 
in what we see as implicit Masonic references throughout. More curiously, though, is the fact that Carlson's de depiction and description, rather, of altering the yin-yang from its original circular design to that of a square is literally an act of squaring the circle, a concept of paramount interest to Freemasons, representing the occult idea of the relationship between the spirit and the physical. The same article notes, the very symbol of Freemasonry means combining the square and circle because the compass draws the circle and the square and the square draws the square. In Freemasonry, the compass and square have a very spiritual significance. Given that the circle is representative of spirit and square matter, it's curious that Carlson would choose to make the square the originally circular yin-yang design. Was the symbolic meaning behind this choice intentional? Moreover, the squaring the circle as a nod to Masonic square and compass becomes more plausible when you look into the ubiquitous version of this glyph, which incorporates two other symbols. On the left are two interlinking twos, one upside down. On the right is a division symbol with apostrophes for points. The interlinking twos are worth putting under a microscope this because at first blush, the way these twos are arranged in relation to the other makes their intersecting points resemble the Masonic square and compass itself. If that's not enough, the use of the twos have a distinctly Masonic numerological meaning as well. Quote, symbol two is composed of two lines. The horizontal base is used the world over as a symbol of the lowest point of involution, the stage of inorganic matter, the level of the mineral kingdom. The curved line rises above from this base, although we usually write it first and start at the top of the figure. I say it rises because the curve is the same kind of a curve as that at the right side of a zero. Notice that although one of the lines in two is straight, both are feminine because of the horizontal line, though straight is always a symbol of the passive, receptive, feminine phase of the life power's self-expression. The Roman notation for two is 11, one, one, and this is the number of the apparent self-division of the one which takes place at the beginning of a cycle of manifestation. It is analogous to the sign for Gemini, the twins, and represents the pillars of the temple. So writes Paul Foster Case on page 78 of Occult Fundamentals and Spiritual Unfoldment. The numerology behind two relates to masonry in its representation of the pillars of the temple, since both pillars, two of them in this case, and temple are key Masonic symbols. Furthermore, there's an added layer of Masonic symbolism when, in keeping with numerology, the twos are considered as adding together to equal four. Symbol four, again, quoting from Paul Foster Care's Occult Fundamentals and Spiritual Unfoldment, symbol four is one of the most ingenious of the numeral symbols when it's drawn in accordance with the ancient rules of proportion. The vertical line is six units long, the horizontal is five units, and the diagonal is also five units. Thus, the total number of units in the three lines required to make the figure is 16, the square of 4. This symbol so drawn combines the Egyptian triangle of 3, 4, 5 with the right angle of 2 times 2. A triangle of these proportions was used in Egypt for surveying, and the right angle is a mason square. Thus, 4 suggests the ideas of measurement, reduction to order, regulation, and so on. Geometrically, 4 is the square. The interplay between spirit and matter as symbolized in the square and compass can also be seen in the use of the division symbol, which could also symbolize the hermetic axiom, as above, so below. This touches on the sympathetic relationship between spiritual and material, or macrocosmic and microcosmic planes. Moreover, the stylized points on the division symbol may refer to the Hebrew letter Yad, which to Mason specifically is the, quote, letter of thought or idea, and prescribe no bounds to its efficacy. It was this letter which, flowing from the primitive light, gave being to emanations. It wearied itself, by the way, but assumed a new vigor by the sense of the letter T, which makes the second of the ineffable name." End quote. It's also worth noting how in symbolic Freemasonry, the god has been replaced by the letter G. But in the advanced degrees, Yod is retained. And within a triangle, as in the illustration, constitutes the symbol of the deity. So this is no surprise, as masonry is heavily based in Hermetic Kabbalah, and Yod is the letter in which, in English, translates to I, and if you're into wordplay, could be a substitute for I, E-Y-E. -E. This then links, albeit somewhat ambiguously, to Bon Iver's initials, B and I, and their incorporation into the album artwork, 
since the eye may also represent the eye of providence. Regardless, if the top apostrophe is representative of God in the spiritual or macrocosmic sense, it follows that the bottom implies that the God of the material microcosm. Now, the more superstitious or sensationalist analyst here may draw the conclusion that some evil entity is being referred to, but in keeping with a humanist perspective, the more contextually accurate representation or interpretation, rather, would be that the bottom yod, in fact, symbolizes man as the image of deity and therefore having the potential for godhood as well. Again, here we see a parallel to the central theme of 33 God, one which we will observe in eight circle as well. As can be seen, and all you got to do is, of course, look up the images for 22 a million, but they will be included in the show notes. As you can see, all of the articles, and again, check out everything I've just mentioned for you. As can be seen, the visual artwork for 22 a million is a symbolic feast in its own right, one that, from our vantage point, is neither an unanswered question nor an open container to be filled with new meaning. These symbols all have distinct, and in our opinion, intentional connotations, many drawing from Masonry's philosophical framework, and most, if not all, having deep esoteric significance. Now tomorrow, in part two, we'll finally get around to dissecting some of the more interesting symbols contained in the song and video, Eight Circle. So tomorrow's Morning Monarchy, we'll get into the occult symbolism in Bon Iver's Eight Circle, part two, the point within the circle. Attention, duped masses! You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. After breaking down the symbolism for the cover art, for Bon Iver's latest album, 22 A Million, and the initial frame of the music video for its current single, Eight Circle, which will be our song of the day at the end of this Morning Monarchy, we're not even one second into the song. As can probably be inferred at this point, the profound and interweaving symbolic meaning throughout 22 A Million makes for a literally exhaustive analysis. In that sense alone, it really is a masterpiece. But for the sake of keeping this relatively brief, we'll make the remaining analysis a little less detailed, leaving the rest of the rabbit hole for the reader to tumble down at their own discretion. In part one, we made what we feel is a pretty convincing case for an occult and specifically esoteric Freemasonic influence behind the album cover for 22 a million and began to outline the same for the eight circle music video. A key to this puzzle, a big key to this puzzle, I believe, is Eric Timothy Carlson, the man Justin Vernon, aka Bon Iver, tapped for the album's companion visual art, which plays an equally important role as the music. In the first part of this series, we also summarized Eric's take on the project in his own words and stated why we differ with his claim that these symbols, that these symbols are unanswered questions, and that they're just open containers to be filled with new meaning. To this end, we recommend you read that if you haven't already. The first symbol we'll analyze in this part is displayed at 47 seconds in sync with the lyrics, Philosophize your figure, what I have and haven't held. The first thing you notice about the symbol is that it denotes the song title with a large circle and an eight at its center. Highly significant as the title in this form represents the Masonic point within a circle which in turn symbolizes the zodiacal sun, the alchemical gold, and more. And there are many links, again, within this story to read about seven planetary metals and all of these things. Known as the circumpunct, it essentially represents God, one's higher self, and the wisdom one receives from God, with quotes around it, to attain that self-ascension. See part one, again, for more on how those intersect. This is reflected in Freemasonry as well as mystery traditions throughout the ages to philosophize the figure of deity, which is really a placeholder for the all-encompassing nature of reality, something incomprehensible to humanity, is what these mystery traditions and really all philosophy have been aiming at since their inception. And although throughout our evolution we've been able to hold in our conception some of its aspects, we have far more of a deity yet to conceive. So it would seem those lyrics and that symbol are elegantly paired. Philosophize your figure, what I have and haven't held. More strikingly, the circumpunct also symbolizes the point of the beginning of creation and eternity, and being that an eight, turned sideways, is the symbol for infinity, we see yet another parallel. In that sense, a circle with a symbol for infinity at its center seems to infer a sense of infinite potential, especially at the beginning of creation. To an artist, this is an especially powerful concept. 
This seems like a good time to give Justin Vernon some context, as we may have led the reader to think. We're implying he or Carlson are speaking coded messages about the spiritual evolution or mankind or the universe itself or some other highfalutin concept. This may very well be, but for the sake of grounded speculation, we're going to suggest that maybe they're just using these symbols to represent something more personal, like their own spiritual journeys, or even just breathing deeper meaning into the creative act of making an album. That's the beauty of these esoteric and really archetypal symbols. Their meaning is infinitely layered and fractal. That doesn't mean they don't have a common thread. In fact, symbolism is a literal representation of the hermetic law of correspondence. In that it's broader and more spiritual meanings can also have a narrower, narrower material significance. For instance, the circumpunct can also represent a blank canvas to draw from. In its simplest or most profound form, like any other symbol used to communicate, it really comes down to the clarity of the message and the level of consciousness held by sender and receiver alike. Moreover, the level of occult knowledge displayed in this project gives us pause. It begs the question who Carlson referred to when talking of the musicians, writers, chillers, curators that frequented Vernon's Wisconsin recording studio, if only we could have been flies on the wall during those winter conversations on humanism, metaphysics, and spirituality while Vernon and his revolving cadre were holed up in Eau Claire's April Bass. That's the name of Justin, Claire, Justin Vernon's recording studio in his home base of Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Alas, all we can do is speculate, though. The symbol at a minute 35 in the video is notable in that it seems to have a distinctly Thelemic bent. For those not versed in the more infamous tropes, Thelema, the religion practiced by an organization called the OTO with Aleister Crowley, a man who at some is, to some, is a savant and others an abomination as its figurehead. The number 777 is a centerpiece of Thelemic numerology to the extent of one of Crowley's books is titled 777. The pyramid's omnipresence among the occult doesn't exclude Crowleyanity, nor do the beams of light radiating from it signaling divinity and illumination. So what kind of illumination, you ask? As to what constitutes official Thelemic practice is a controversial topic. However, if the example set by Crowley is any indication, they involve a kind of hedonistic mysticism utilizing both sex and drugs. This is pertinent, according to an entry on the lyrics 4-8 circle, the corresponding passage, I'm underneath your tongue, references the hallucinogenic and some say spiritually illuminating drug acid, LSD. The popular hallucinogenic drug LSD can be taken by placing a small piece of chemically laced paper under the tongue. Vernon is using the same imagery here, but with himself as the subject instead. This can mean two things. Justin is equating his music with a psychedelic experience, telling the listener they're about to do the equivalent of tripping. Or Justin is equating himself with a psychedelic experience, telling the subject of the song that he's altering their mental states in the same way as LSD would. Light and the pyramid are also symbolic working tools in Freemasonry. This is no surprise, as like its spiritual forefather, the Golden Dawn, the Lima draws from the same occult wellsprings as Freemasonry and also from the craft directly. The equal armed cross at the apex of the pyramid is also used by Thelema and Masonry in their shared incorporation of Knights Templar symbolism in their traditions. A slightly modified version of this cross was also used as an ancient symbol for a shaman or magician and was a precursor to the cross used by Godfrey of Bullion when he helped lead the First Crusade. The tradition of Crusades would lead to the birth of the Knights Templar, and it's a curious symbolic link. The symbol around the 3 minute 30 second mark seems to be Carlson's take on the Tree of Life, which again, prominent in Thelema, Freemasonry, and any other traditions incorporating Kabbalah, loosely referred to as Western Esotericism or the Western Mystery Tradition. The reader will note their similarity on face and how, like the Tree of Life, its spheres are organized into three columns. It's unlike the Tree of Life and its rows, however, it does incorporate 11 seraphot, sephirot, rather, in keeping with the Tree of Life graphics incorporating the sphere of Doth. It's also notable that an 11-sphere tree is used here instead of the traditional 10-sphered one, as Crowley was fond of 11s and incorporated that number into Thelema, as with 93, located in the top middle column of the symbol at around the 3 minute 30 second mark. 
The altered, somewhat compressed version of the tree is reminiscent of what Jewish Kabbalists describe when they talk about creation prior to the fall of man. This is interesting in the context of themes touched on earlier. New beginning, cycles, infinity, the source, the blank canvas. When paired with the scythe running from bottom left to top right, a contrasting symbol representing time, limitation, mortality, and endings, the meaning becomes somewhat ambiguous and the common thread remains uncut. The M that appears at 3 minutes 38 isn't really significant on its own, but in relation to the subsequent glyph, the interlinking twos that we analyzed in part one, it becomes noteworthy. The Masonic connotations of the twos seem to be confirmed by the presence of the M directly beforehand. Additionally, in numerology, the number 715, a western Wisconsin area code covering Eau Claire, which he incorporated into the song title 715 Creeks, another song on 22 a million, can be reduced to 13, 7 plus 1 plus 5, the ordering of the letter M in the English alphabet. The letter M also plays a role in the album title, aside from the obvious in that the accounting symbol for a million is MM. The reference in this context may be an abbreviation for Master Mason, especially in relation to the symbolism of 22, which we've already covered. This symbolically translates the album title as Square and Compass, a Master Mason. Is this the smoking gun implicating Bon Iver as a bunch of Freemasons? Not necessarily. After all, you may note the presence of a double M in the title of this media venture as well. Our final analysis is of the passage around 3 minute and 40 seconds. To walk aside your favor, I'm an estuary king. I'll keep in a cave your comfort and all unburdened and becoming. A genius.com annotation for the first line states... Astuary, A-S-T-U-A-R-Y, is likely a combination of the Greek term for star, aster, and estuary, a meeting point between fresh and saltwater bodies. Vernon likely utilizes the estuary piece to represent the dichotomous relationship between divinity and humanity, or more personally, God and himself. The phrase, Astuary King, likely indicates his kingdom, Eau Claire, Wisconsin, and potentially his role as point position between the worlds of the temporal and the eternal. One defining characteristic of Eau Claire, Vernon's hometown, is the confluence of the Chippewa and Eau Claire rivers. While not an estuary in a traditional sense, this meeting point between the two bodies of water provides the line with interesting context. This image is hardly a new idea to Vernon himself, as author and collaborator Michael Perry remarked before Bon Iver's 2015 performance at Eau Claire's Music Festival, quote, It's good to have music near a river. This is the idea of baptism, of absolution, no matter what you believe. Better yet, it's good to have music near a place where two rivers come together, a confluence. What are we but a confluence? End quote from Michael Perry. The line about remaining in a cave should be familiar to those upon their alternative media research since Plato's allegory of the cave has been discussed over countless fringe research platforms at this point in relating the two. Another genius contributor had this to say, quote, Another interpretation links this line with Plato's allegory of the cave, an allegory presented by the Greek philosopher in his greatest work, The Republic. The cave represents the sheltered existence of a cave in which prisoners, normal people, are made to believe that the shadows cast on the wall are real and pure objects. When one prisoner escapes from the cave, he experiences a profound, newfound reality beyond what he previously considered to be real. Plato surmises that the escaped prisoner would be unable to persuade his peers to make a similar journey, thus leaving them comfortably confined in their ignorance. Here, Vernon could be taking comfort in his ignorance by keeping in the cave, unburdened, by the knowledge of reality and becoming in his comfortable demeanor. We'll agree with this take, excluding the last part. Instead of Vernon symbolizing some kind of self-imposed ignorance, it makes more sense these lyrics refer to those in general who are unready or unwilling to deepen their understanding of themselves and reality. These are the ones doomed to remain in the cave. So far gone, they ridicule or even lash out at others who speak plainly to them the vast expanse lying just beyond the walls. They, according to Vernon and Carlson, are the ones who must be conveyed meaning symbolically in stories silhouetted against walls with shadow puppets. Now, the skeptical reader may be inclined to say something like, you're just 
cherry picking symbols to fit your theory that somehow connects to the occult and Freemasonry. And in to a certain extent, they'd be right. But the symbols we're selecting happen to be important relative to the song, the album as a whole, and most of all, each other. And the motifs expressed in their meaning occur throughout the project. After all, what's a work of art without thematic elements that drive a coherent narrative? That said, the aim of an artistically symbolic piece isn't always to evoke an objective meaning. Instead, it sometimes attempts to project the artist's own subjective landscape onto the, the external world and affect the audience on a mostly subconscious level. Still, more often than there, more often than not, there are concrete symbolic meanings that can be derived utilizing a thorough knowledge of archetypal symbolism. The overarching theme here seems to be the implication of occult and Freemasonic concepts and the wisdom derived from their consideration on the consciousness of Justin Vernon and, by extension, the music of Bon Iver. This, to us, is an abstract multimedia expression of the doctrines driving Western occultism. It's also a pretty staggering accomplishment on the parts of Justin Vernon and Eric Timothy Carlson. We don't think the takeaway from this piece is necessarily the esoteric significance of an individual song or even the album as a whole, nor is it necessarily evidence of a vast occult conspiracy. This is valuable as an example of the saturation of overt occult symbolism in entertainment and media, especially music and the visual art it employs. These symbols are pervasive in hip-hop, EDM, rock, metal, but as seen here also appear in the sort of indie mainstream, which dovetails with broader discussion on fringe topics like occultism becoming a greater, more transparent part of popular culture. But I digress. I hope that we've emphasized how our position isn't that Bon Iver and Eric Timothy Carlson are in on some shadowy occult agenda, nor is it that they aren't. We're simply using this as an exercise in symbolic analysis to find deeper, hidden meanings in popular culture. After all, as Confucius noted some 2,500 years ago, quote, signs and symbols rule the world, not words, nor laws. Occult Symbolism in Bon Iver's Eight Circle, Part 2, The Point Within the Circle. A huge thanks to at Benjamin Seagram and at Swagger Prance for doing the research and compiling what I hope will be future work that we'll do. You're listening to The Morning Monarchy for Friday, October 14th, 2016. I am James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com. You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. Since 2005, Media Monarchy has covered the real news about politics, health, technology, and the occult. All remixed with music and media that matters. Go to MediaMonarchy.com slash support and become a monthly subscriber so you can help keep independent, non-commercial, alternative media going and growing. Thanks.